Like, are you fucking kidding me with this right now? I felt gypped. You are, as they say, um, you are a survivor of mass destruction. Oh my. <laughs> and that's the title. <laughs> you are a survivor of mass destruction. Oh yep. my God. Well, uh, or a victim of mass destru- destruction is another one. Welcome to the Novel Universe with your hostesses, Ashley and Dawn. We rate and review the newest and most buzzworthy books. We are true book club girls who don't always agree, but do enjoy a good book discussion. I'm Ashley, the fantasy architect. And I'm Dawn, the criticizer of books. Grab your favorite beverage and come and enjoy our universe. Because it is long. 
and she's setting the pace for a lot of things to come. So, yeah, that was my first qualm with this book was the length. <laughs> okay, so this is, hopefully I am going to be making sense. Um, well, I basically thought it was too long too. And um, so I agree with everything you said. I'm trying to read my notes here. Okay. All right. So my main dislike is I think that Mass writes for her fans. And I'm beginning to think that I am not a fan anymore. I love Throne of Glass. I only got to book two in Akatar, and I'm I won't be reading this the next book in the series. Sorry, Ashley. Um, but and here's here's my problem with the book. She has a lot of characters, and they all have their own stuff, which is fine. But and like we said, we will be spoiling this book. This is this is a spoiler edition. There is no spoiler free. So I'm about to spoil all of it. So if you have not read it yet, you need to jump out now. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Bye-bye. Okay. So everybody has their own stuff. And like I said, which is fine. And I like a book where everybody is on the same goal. Like everybody has the same goal. And in this book, at the beginning of the book, the goal was to find Sophie. And to figure out what she knows and to go on from there. Once they find Sophie, then everybody kind of goes off on their own and they all don't have the same agenda. And I feel like Mass writes for her fans because her fans like characters and they like to follow these characters on their journey and they like to see what's going to happen to them in the next book because... It starts off as just a little teaser in this book, but we know something big is going to happen with Tyrion. I was calling him Tyrion, sorry. In the <laughs> next book. And we know something big is going to happen with Rune and Daybreaker, Day, whatever her name is, in the next book. Like, But in this book, it's just they have their own little journey that is totally separate from the main goal. And I personally don't like that because... I just felt like she did not invest enough time. I did not care about Tyrion going to the Viper Queen. I didn't care. I did not care about Ruin and Daybreaker. I did not care about Fury and Juniper. I did not care about Celeste, Celestial, whatever her name is, and Oh Home Girl. I didn't care because she didn't really develop. And you would think 800 pages would be enough to develop. And it just wasn't because it's so many characters. So, I just don't like her writing style anymore. I felt like Throne of Glass didn't do this, and I don't like her writing style anymore. Yeah, so I have to agree with you in the sense that there was a shift in the writing style of this book. Okay. There, in, in, my, per, in my opinion, I, like, like you said, the, the start of the book, they're on a, a, a set trajectory to find this Sophie Renass person. She is the catalyst that's, like, sending everything out, out of whack, and they have to find her. She's the last link to Danica. Somehow she's the last Thunderbird, which is, like, a whole other thing, you know, in and of itself. Yada, yada, yada. So they all kind of marry band together, and I'm like, okay, cool, sounds good. But then after that happened, it's like then we broke out – into the characters and having their own underlying stories kind of like what happens in um throwing the glass series in the queen of shadows like we start to see that shift and then into empire of storms where it's like each chapter or each section is based on one or two characters and their journey through how they're getting to this point or whatever which for me as a Moss lover, like I've read every single book that she's that she's written and my hardest um, problem with uh, Preston City, the first one was that I didn't understand her writing style because I'm used to what happened at the end of the book where it's very much so character driven. 
versus plot driven in a lot of ways. So like I got to that part and I was like, oh shoot. Like there's like that's Moss style writing. Because then like everything like everything was set in motion. You understood like they're all kind of like fighting for their own purposes to better themselves in this world, but yet they're doing it together. Like they each have their own um sky or accomplishment that they're trying to reach and they all help each other and then they move on type of a thing whereas like in a kotar like they are all fighting for the same exact thing they're Mm -hmm. fighting for the same goal so it's it's really interesting to me to see those two different styles like all of a sudden like it go from one to the other because then that to me made sense I was like, oh, I get it. Because someone else on Book Talk, her name's Brittany, and I don't remember her last name or her handle, but she had made a comment while I was reading where she got to a certain point and was like, there's Moss. Like, there's the Moss that we know from these other writings that she's done before. So I think that might have been why. I personally had a problem with the length and how the story went itself because it's so in depth. It's so intricate. Everyone and everybody has their own thing happening. And it's like, if you don't pay attention, you are going to miss what is going on. Similar to game of Thrones. You don't know why they fired that person. Well, you add a look because it's going to pop up four books later and you best remember what, what happened. So, it's interesting that she's kind of stepping into this like very in-depth world right away versus like a build-up to it and so maybe you know we just aren't prepared for that style of writing or what it is because I told you in the first book I had a really big problem like being connected to this book which is abnormal for me um and so in this second one it started off again the same way I was like like what what is going on and then I got to you know basically it was like halfway through the book after you learn about Sophie and I was like oh oh like there it is like so I don't I don't know what that's about personally but so you like you like that you like when they all have their own they're going their own way I personally did because it's very similar because the the end goal is to take out the Asteri, right? Like, the end goal is to change the hierarchy of where they're living. That's, like... But is everybody fighting for that goal? Is that what Tyrion is fighting for? Everyone is fighting for their freedom in their own way. That's the best way I can put it. But I think Tyrion is also... He's fighting his own need to not be a part of a world that's suffocating. Because each world is like, (laughs) because each people, community, if you will, is all shoved into this, you know, Pangera style thing or whatever. And they all have their own, you know, um, traditions and people and how they do things. It's all abnormal and different. So I think that's what's going on is they're fighting for freedom to lead their lifestyle that they're used to okay well i mean that makes sense i still don't like it but it's okay. it makes sense that's what I, oh. and i could be totally wrong like, no i think you're right but it to me like when i looked at it that way then the whole setup of it made more sense and i enjoyed it more once i figured that out okay because uh, I was just I I was just salty because we spent half of the book finding someone who's dead and then we find out Emil has no power and I'm like like are you fucking kidding me with this right now I felt gypped you are as they say um 
you are a survivor of mass destruction. (laughs) And that's the title. (laughs) You are a survivor of mass destruction. Oh, my God. uh, Or a victim of mass destruction is another one that they say. Um, Because she is just... (laughs) Her is a right... She did not disappoint me. And a lot of the things that got dropped in this book, the mind bone like plot twists, I was in my car when I learned about who Danica's mate is, and I about lost my, I almost peed myself because I did not see that coming. I don't At, because there were so many characters. I honestly don't even remember that guy from book one. So when Baxter, Bastian, whatever. When it was revealed, I was just like, I don't know who that is. I don't know why oh, I'm supposed to care. Oh, see, I reread book one, though. In all fairness, I literally just reread book one to prepare for book two because, like, I, I felt like I missed everything. And so if I would not have done that, all these, you know, secondary characters, I'd have been like, who the hell is that? <laughs> Where did you come from? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Because they're so many people um so yeah so she still does not disappoint with the jaw dropping plot twist because i did not see that coming my whole entire time with Baxian um was who what does he know like who is he connected to like are you just trying to be like a softie get on hunts get side because this guy was horrible like he was he was really bad <laughs> You know, he um, was aligned with the Harpy and the Bloodhound and the Hind and, like, all these other, like, really horrible people that, you know, their method of interrogation is just horrendous, right? Like, they are all about the bloodshed. And so to then find that he was mated to Danica, girl who's got a hundred million secrets, that I literally like put I was so over the fact that Danica was hiding all of these secrets because it's like well then you didn't even know her as a character no at all like who who we first meet as Danica is not who Danica is she is a conniving hidden agenda person who was out to find her own bloodline and to speak out what was really going on. And she was playing everyone, playing everyone, even her best friend, who she calls a sister, Bryce. And it's like, I lost a little bit of trust for her. <laughs> like, I lost, like, loving their friendship because Bryce has literally been denied truth from Danica in a lot of areas and to me that makes her a not trustworthy person even though she sent all of them on this crazy journey to find sophie to find the truth about this theory to find the truth about first light all of this stuff and it's like but you lied to your best friend and she had to look like an idiot over and over and over again you know Mm mm-hmm I don't oh, know. Yeah. I don't know if Mass plans out her books. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if she has all of her books planned out from book one to book five or whatever. It seems like she writes the first book, it becomes popular, and then she has to be like, oh, now I need to go back and do more stuff with this character. Because I feel like Danica wasn't set up in book one to behave the way she was in book two yeah i think i would agree with that especially with danica i don't like like i said i don't when when they came out that moss was writing an adult fantasy book right i think she struggled with it trying to be adults and then she shifted in, like I said, to her old style of writing, and that made more sense because we got all of these backstories that all will eventually play out, you know, on these separate little side stories, like she did in Throne of Glass. 
and she did in a Kochar as well. So it's, I don't know. I feel like the book suffered in that retrospect for the for it because yeah. <laughs> That's all I have. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> My other other big problem, and I could be wrong, was I feel like the ending, which was, is it the Asteri? I got them all mixed up. Who's the bad guy at the end? The Asteri. Okay. So they're just like yeah. siphoning life off of all these other people from other dimensions. But I feel like there was little to no foreshadowing through the first half of the book, the first 700 pages of the book. There was a little bit. Because they kept talking about first light, which I still don't know what the hell that is. But they kept talking about that. And that is a foreshadow. But there but there was no foreshadow to the to them stealing like all of their life force just to stay alive. Like I feel like that came out of nowhere. Am I wrong? Um I think you might have just missed it. And that is simply because the first book is so long as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's the... So, the Asteri are... I mean, I know who they are. I know who they are. I just can't remember between them and the other guys. I got them mixed up. But my point is that this book, people... Readers like to make predictions in her books. And, um... But I feel like no one was able to predict this because she didn't set this up. I feel like there was no set up for this major revelation at the end of the book. There's no theories yeah. on this at all. I I don't think there was because at the same time, even because I'm just like, I, I feel like she's breaking it to us slowly and that's why it's agonizing. I don't like that. Because, okay. I, to me, it reminds me a lot of what she did in the Throne of Glass series, where, you know, at first it was just, you know, Aileen trying to battle against, you know, this these hidden forces that, that were coming out. And then it turned into this whole big thing, right? Yeah. So he, I feel like she's, like, piecemealing it. And that's and my problem. Because- I feel like yeah, she hasn't planned out her book. She's just writing it as it comes along. And I don't like that. I feel like she should... I feel like writers who write a series, they kind of plot what's going to happen in their book and they have an idea of how a book is going to progress and they make sure that you drop hints in book one that come back in book three and keep going. Whereas I feel like even in Throne of Glass, which I love, by the way, the first book could have been a standalone and then she's like, oop de doop I got to make other stuff. So let me create the Valge and all of that stuff. And she just kept adding and adding and adding. But I just felt like that was done a little bit better because they, they all had the same goal. Whereas this one, yeah, it's a lot of different characters. They all have different goals. They have the same goal, but they have their own stuff. I don't... It's just a lot. Yeah. It's, it's I just felt like it's yeah. a little incohesive uncohesive you know what i mean no not I cohesive think, no I, I think fair i think it's fair to say and i and i'm saying that you know like i have a completely different opinion which is totally fine right like but i think that if you 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 can't just pick this book up and go i'm gonna sit and read it like you have to it, she writes it to be dissected and to like really think about it and I think that's what was happening and it's to me it's not as big of a shock because I literally just reread book one again you know what I mean which is sad which is sad that it's like we you have to like pre-prep yourself so you remember what the heck's going on because there was so much character um based storyline with the first um, book and then it went into plot and I was like oh um I but I want more of the characters and it was still like into plot and then it went back to characters and stuff like that so I just I I hear what you're saying I I personally think it was there and it was enough for me um but I do okay with like giving me a little bit at a time um 
because there was a foreshadow about it in the last book about this theory and everything like that. But we originally thought that the bad people were the archangels, and they're not. They're being controlled by the Asteri. You know, so it's like they're using them to further their their own game. They remind me of the book The Host. Do you remember that book? Barely. Okay, well, they're like, you know, leeching basically in and how they talked about how they, you know, bred out the fey ears and they bred out them remembering that they were enemies and like all of this stuff. Like it's super deep and it's a lot. I will give you that. It's a lot (laughs) because a lot of this all gets dropped in us at the end and then we're left with that giant cliffhanger, which I still don't know if I'm okay with that. Because I, yeah, I still don't know if I'm okay with it. <laughs> with the ending of the book, for me personally, which we can talk about. But, yeah, yeah if they, I think it was there. I do, I mean, you really gotta, you gotta, you almost have to, like, write it down with, like, a pen and paper, you know? Like, I a mean, little note. I don't blame her from for readers not remembering what happened. In book one, that's up to the reader to refresh their memory. And I chose not to, that's on me, and that's fine. But I I still personally think that she did not do enough foreshadowing for, for us to be like, to be able to create theories and predictions of that ending. I still feel like that ending came out of nowhere. Even in book one, even in uh, book two. I mean, forget book one. I didn't remember anything happened book one. Forget that. Book two, I still feel like there should have been more. And I feel like that came out of left field. I but, think, yeah, yeah. We can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, another thing, because I had, we had some predictions about Jezebia. Do you remember Jezebia? Her old boss. Yeah. Who has like the vibrate and everything like that. Mm-hmm. So like the last part of book one, we see the Prince of Hell and Jezebia chatting away on a park bench, like, mm, you're gonna have to move the stuff. Mm, things are about to happen. Make sure you protect it. Like that was like the last of book one, okay? So going into book two, I'm like, all right, Jezebia, this girl has like hidden archives that have been passed down for a millennia and we still don't know what all is in her trove what all she holds she just always happens to have the missing link somewhere some way um you know and it's like Jezebia was part was um in she was in like the first part of the book like when they had to go to the bone quarter and they had they, they were trying to like buy passage over to see if Connor's soul and Danica's soul they were resting peacefully at yada 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 in that place and she's like I only have one left to make it work you know or whatever and it's like that was the last we heard of Jezebia <laughs> and I'm like this girl has her own freaking story where is she at you know what I mean and then we're then introduced to more of like Flynn's backstory and Declan and Therian and I'm like okay okay so there was a lot of I felt like the characters were underdeveloped in a lot of ways because there was a lot of time spent on the plot and then all of a sudden it was like let's chat about the characters and actually give them like a storyline if you will like i loved the whole bro dynamic with ethan flynn and declan and ruin and like all of that like they're all bachelors they're all just trying to find their own place in the world yada 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 but yet they band together like we need you need you to come help i love that imagery because especially for ethan because he's part of both he was excommunicated out of the wolf pack because he stood up for bryce and was like Y'all are being mean to her. She didn't do nothing. She literally saved everybody, and you're all just giving her a hard time for no reason. Then he's excommunicated from his pack, you know, 
and then they <laughs> they go on this merry band hunt to find Sophie Renast and her brother Emil, and turns out that Sophie's dead. Oh, and by the way, Sophie was in love with Cormac, who is Bryce's cousin, who comes and is like, oh, you're going to be my bride. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing a love triangle. Don't you do that to me. I don't want to see it. But my squish that. Thank God. Like, that was just a little blip in time. I about, like, lost my mind. I was like, I ain't got time for this. Like, this should not be in here. And it wasn't. I was okay with that. Like, I was okay with him coming in and being like, but I really need you to help me find her because she's, like, the love of my life and whatever. Okay, cool. You know, and then you find Emil. And then Emil then becomes, like, Bryce's adoptive brother. Like, to save him because he ain't got no powers. Like, I wasn't, like, Bryce. There was a quote in the book that summed her up perfectly. Bryce was is a collector of lost things or of hurt hurt things, things that need fixing. And that's what she did is she collected people who need like fixing and things. So I liked that because it gave us a little bit more about Bryce. But yeah, her and Hunt's relationship, I was like I was there for, but I wasn't like chapter 55 there for, if you will. Well, let's, let's break some of that up because you went on like four different topics. I know. Sorry. Go ahead. Break it up. Um, this is what happened. Um, okay. So you were talking and I'm not saying that you're comparing it to Game of Thrones or anything, but you were talking about how it's like it's an adult book there's more in here gotta take notes and I totally disagree so yeah I know this is adult fantasy but I think the only reason why it's adult is because of the sex like I I I as someone who has read some adult fantasy this is not good enough as far as intellect and critique It's just a lot of characters and their stuff. And it doesn't really go into anything deeper. And that's what I was missing. So like Tyrion actually, I kept calling him Tyrion because I actually did not like this book. And I had to amuse myself. And one way to do that is to change character names. So I'm just calling him Tyrion. He actually had a really good storyline because he doesn't like who he, he he, not who he is. He, he wants to be above water. He's kind of stuck in this marriage with this woman who's a big baby. And he's like a slave to the river queen. And he doesn't want to, but he does that duty. And, you know, so he has a very interesting storyline. But they don't... Mass does not go into it at all. It's really just very surface level. He's just like, okay, river queen, I'll do it. And everyone's like, why are you, like doing what she says stand up for yourself and he's just like it's my duty and his wife is like give me to tell me mommy like he has something there it's not developed at all and rune once again he actually has a really good storyline as well he is a reluctant a reluctant ruler he has daddy issues he is kind of in the shadow of his sister even though he's the chosen one kind of he's got this awesome sword like he has a lot going on in his storyline too but it's reduced Mm -hmm. to him and daybreak to just him lusting after this woman even though he's betrothed to this other woman who's dating this other woman like there's a lot to work with here but i feel like it's very surface level she doesn't get into any serious themes really it's just much skimming on the surface and her books rely heavily on a lot of characters and fey sex sorry and just it just could be deeper and when i read an adult fantasy and i've said this before if i read adult fantasy i expect to be challenged i i wasn't challenged at all and i just i just I don't Which like is, it. I consider is, this yeah. I consider this fluff. I Okay. Yeah. I see and I I I personally would would put it as 
as adult because of the complexity of the characters. I wouldn't. Because there's so many things. I wouldn't at all. You like know? so. Okay, so like my what, what just one like one little example. So like I'm trying to think. Um, as far as adults, if I'm going to compare like a character study, I'm expecting it to be on the level of the fifth season by N.K. Jemison. I expect that is the level of adult fantasy I am expecting. I am expecting a Robin Hobb, which I don't think you've read, but I'm expecting yeah. that type of adult fantasy character study and or even just V Schwab. I don't get that here. It's I feel like it's very surface like Vicious by V Schwab. I expect that type of character development and I don't I don't get it in the in her books. Oh. Well, see, and that's that's I think part of like where you know you and I differ on like what we enjoy. Yeah. You know, it's just because this season I hated it. You know, and you loved it. Mm-hmm. So it's, but I think this is what makes for such a great book discussion is because, like, everyone has their own level of how they want to be challenged, like, while they're reading and what they deem to be, like, a really good read. Yeah. Whereas, like, I have friends that are like, if, if I, if the last, when I read the last page of the book, if I'm less satisfied, I will give a book five stars. And it's like, Oh, really? Because I would not do that. I would, like, really look at it and really be like, oh, okay, like, did I like this? Did I like that? Like, so it's just awesome to see the different levels in, like, how we read a book when you're reading it, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I do agree with you, though. Like, there wasn't anything to be challenged in, like, theme-wise, I guess. Except for, like, there was the big talk on, like, slavery and being enslaved and stuff like that was, like, brought up in the book, being owned. It's still very, stuff, but it's like still surface it's, level. They didn't really go too deep into it. There, yeah. Yeah. So, because someone else had said that, and I was like, I don't know if I agree if that's worthy to talk about in it. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, do you want to just start with, um, what were your thoughts on Bryce? I don't like Bryce. Um, I don't, I, she's, she's not, there's not much to her. Like, yeah, like she's a badass and she wears her cute little dresses and her high, high heels and she's sexy and everybody loves her. All the men love her and she's a nice person and she's smart She's like all the things, but that's yeah. it. She's strong and she's smart and she's sexy. And she's a, she's the dream, but that's she does have some flaws. Where that, like you said, she's a collector of things, and she wants like she was going to help this boy, even though it could kill her and everyone around her. That I consider that to be a flaw because she's not taking other people' life into in consideration. It's admirable, yeah. but it's still a little bit of a flaw. Other than that, yeah. she has no flaws. Yeah. Well, other than she don't she don't talk to people about what she's doing. She's very she reminds me a lot of Aileen yep. in the way she kept her mouth shut. Yeah. With in her plotting. And it's like didn't we learn from the first one? We don't do that. Mm-hmm. Like we in places that are not good but at the same time I feel like it reflects her as a character because she is an ind- independent person she's had to make it on her own for quite some time and so she's just created a world where she operates solely as the main driver and has a hard time letting other people operate it with her you know so it's like I wish my hope in book three is that we get like this other deeper level because now she's separated from the people she loves like 110 percent, and is stuck in a world where she knows no one so yeah but i wasn't for the hunt 
and her like romance like i it was like a it was like a six seven out of ten it wasn't really a ten for me i was there for it but i was like Anymore. Yeah, I, I, like, okay, well, so once again, I'm not, I'm not a big Aquatar fan, um, so I don't really know the whole mate lore that everybody else was. I watched a couple of booktubers talk about the book, and, like, everyone's like, oh my god, they're mates, I didn't see that coming, and everyone's, like, shocked, and it's just, like, over my head, so wow. I don't get that, but I didn't like them nearly as much as I liked Feyre and Rhysand. Now, I felt like they were hot. And they were the only reason why I read book two because they were hot in book one. But I didn't get any of that heat with Hunt and Bryce. Yeah. That's it. Um, I think it's an underdeveloped situation between them because they're just understanding or starting to learn what it means to be mated. Because as Hunt talks about it, he's like, this is, like, from olden times. Like, old. Like, you don't find a maid. Like, you know, and so they, I don't think they understand the complexity of it, if okay. you will. And so that might be why it's less attractive is because, you know, with Resand and Feyre, it was, like, this whole big thing, right? Okay. And it's, like... So I don't think they understand it. And I think they're going to. I think that might be, like, the purpose of it. It's a, But it's, like, a slow burn still. I'm still slow burning over here. And it's, like. I'm burned out. I want the Ruin and Daybreaker crap. Like, that was great. <laughs> like, what is happening? <laughs> you know? Um, so let's. Uh, I guess we'll just go down the list. Do you want to talk about Rune? Yeah. Um. Was the Hind in book one? Yes. Okay. I don't remember her. My problem yeah. with her, the Hind and Pippa was that I felt like there was a lot of telling about how horrible they were and how maniacal they were, but there was not a lot of showing. So I never saw Hind, the Hind be a horrible person. I was just kept being told so. And so when it was revealed that she was Daybreaker, I was just like, because I didn't really know her. So I, I couldn't, I didn't develop any like, oh my God, yay, or oh my God, ew. I didn't really know her. I'm still shocked. I am still shocked. I I thought, I see, and I, I, there was a moment in the book where I was like, I swear to goodness, if it's behind, I'm going to pee my pants. And I did because I did, I was, I was, I was secretly hoping it wasn't just because I was sick and tired of the, of the interwoven spider web between everyone. Just for my brain, for my brain personally, it was like having a hard time wrapping it around, you know, Baxian and Danica. And then you're going to throw that there. I'm like, <laughs> you know. So it was just, it wasn't bad, but I was like, oh, I wonder if, I wonder if it was. And then we kind of skiddly booted across it and I was like, oh, okay. And then it happened and I was like, oh, because yet again, you're right. We, we didn't have, the hind wasn't speaking in a lot of the books. We didn't see her like physically massacre all of these people, you know, like it's talked about, but she sends like the heartbeat to do her bidding. Like, so she uses the heartbeat to do it because she is actually a rebel. That yeah. She want to do it herself. I mean, it makes sense. So I'm like, at the end, you find sense. out, but still. But still, it's like, whoop, you know? And so their whole relationship, I was there for because I like Rune. I really do. I am there for him 100%. I feel for him big time. So I really like him. And I like the fact that he's not being like an over brooding brother. That's like, like when Bryce steps into her power and all of that stuff and whatever, he's not like, you can't go anywhere. He's like, oh, okay. We're guess we're all going along with, but could you just maybe like, just 
let us know what you're doing type of, I don't know their relationship is 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 beautiful and I really like it yeah personally. I agree um Therian yet again I someone commented on a on a book too and said that they thought that Therian was kind of like Fenris from Throne of Glass series like they're trying to write a Fenris like character and I was like I don't I don't see that. You know, he's one of Rowan's um, people. Okay. If you, you know, I think he's a mountain lion is what he turns into or whatever. But he's like the funny jokester that's always off doing his own thing. It kind of has his own hidden agenda, if you will. It doesn't really fit in where he's at. And I got that with Darian, and I was actually glad that he um, left the... What is, what is she called? The River the Queen. Ri- Thank you. <laughs> the River Queen. But he makes dumb choices. The boy makes dumb choices. Like, very, like, rash. Like, oh, crap. We're in a situation. I guess I should just leave. And he runs to the Viper Queen, of all people. And it's like, excuse me? <laughs> You're going to sell your... your your freedom to someone else and she's just as bad i don't get that i don't get that maybe they're setting them up for a relationship if it's a relationship it's gonna be him and the dragon whatever that cheeky boo is girl i skipped all that i was over it i'm like i can't take any more characters oh no okay sorry well, let's talk about Hypaxia. Um, she and Miss Celest- Celestina, the other archangel, did not see that coming. Oh, okay. No. That thing. Makes, makes perfect sense because it was Celestina when she's supposed to be made into this guy and she's like, I am not having it. Yada, yada, yada. Like, I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> like, oh, she love her somewhere. <laughs> But did not see that coming <coughs> at all. And you can see the start of like a love triangle between Hypaxia and Fairy in a little bit in Ruin. If you wanted to like put one there, because he definitely has got some hots for her. Therian? Hmm? Oh. Oh, she goes, oh. <laughs> I didn't, I don't remember that, but. Yeah. Um. What's the other one? Okay, so Ethan. Ugh, I what? hated his story. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. I. I did not see like the whole thing with the mystic and all of that stuff happening, where he like finds the lost like Cinder. Um, alpha that's been missing which makes sense because Danica's mom what's her name Sabine thank you Sabine has been on like this rocker about protecting her title and what's gonna be hers and all of this stuff and the prime's still up and kicking and whatever and so I'm curious to see how that's gonna play out but again, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Is there anything else that you want to talk about before well, we get into get into the what? Last we don't part? have spoilers. Um, I remember in our first podcast that we were very upset that there was no booty time. So there was a lot of booty time in this one. So what are your thoughts? Um, I thought it was good though, in a lot of ways because it it wasn't like a whole bunch of um like 15 pages of booty time does that make sense like it was sprinkled in there well in my opinion what about you um i was your 
What was your favorite booty time? Let's talk about that. What's your favorite booty time? I hate to say this, but I was skipping over it. I don't like <gasps> them. I don't like them. And I didn't really? like the, the, the talk during because it was cringy. And I read the first two, but after the sweaty oral, I was over it. I, I'm like, I can't. I don't care about them anymore. So I felt I bad because I knew we were going to talk about it, but I was like, I don't know. Oh, it's okay because I watched um, the book talker, you know, a booktuber, I forget her name, but she was like, I'm sorry, but if my man is talking to me while we about to get it on, he's not doing it right. <laughs> I think I saw her too. You know, so that was hilarious because um, I like bypass all the talking because I like in my brain, I'm like, let's just, you know, get it over with and move on. And I'm like, he's just talking to her doing it. But I'm like, do you talk that much? Like, like <laughs> oh, it was funny. Because <laughs> then when I looked back on it, I was like, oh, yeah, there was a lot of like. Know, give me all the purrs and whatever and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> that's all I really had. Okay. Um, let's talk about the end then because okay. I feel like we got into a lot with it. Um, so. She finds out the thing that Sophie died for, the thing that Danica died for, right? She learns all about the Assyri and the fact that they're basically siphoning power to live. And they've been doing it for millions and millions of years, conquering other worlds and whatever. Um, and they get to the throne room because they get caught. And this is when we all figure out that the Hind is actually a rebel. Back to the end is there as well and that the hind has helped Bryce because they know that Bryce can teleport now with her powers out of wherever she's at and so she says goodbye to her mate and her brother and her brother finally spills the guts of like you need to step in and be queen that you are because of everything that you hold in your power it's not it's not me it's gonna be you which that was all beautiful all of the goodbyes were all beautiful and it was really sad and I was crying and it was great um, but then, you know, she jumps um, into the gate, hoping to find Adius, the Prince of Hell, and she, lo and behold, lands in Rhysian's court. And guess who picks her up? Our, um, our own shadow singer, Asriel. Asriel picks her up. And, and you know how I know this? As it references his scarred hands. And I was like, excuse me? Like, <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, and so then she's brought into Rhysand and Feyre's, like, house, basically. And she's, she's, she meets Amran. She meets Nesta and Cassian. I didn't see a reference to more. Did you see a reference to more at all? I don't even know who these people you are talking about are. I told you I didn't get past book two. Okay. So this was all oh. lost on me. Oh, no, Dawn. Oh, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I'll dissect as best I can for you. So she gets there, and she's, like, talking to them, and Amryn is like, honey, no one has spoken your language in a very long time. Like, they're all speaking in a different language. No one can understand her in any capacity. And so, Rhysand being almighty Rhysand, who always, like, knows everything, he reminds me a lot of Aileen in a lot of retrospects. Like, he just has, like, so much knowledge. He introduces himself and is like, hello, Bryce Quinlan. <laughs> My name is Rhysand. <laughs> and, like, that was it, you know? And so all that happens there is that her star sword ends up on the ground, which is twin 
to Azriel's sword, Shadow Singer, or Shadow Slayer, I think is the name, which if you read, if you remember in the book, Bruin's gift is shadows. And Raysan looks like looks like Bruin. Like she is like, oh my gosh, like you like he looks like Bruin, but without Bruin's tattoos and his piercings and stuff like that. So that whole thing happens. And now I don't know. I don't know where this book's going to go <laughs> because now you're intermixing two very, very big worlds, very big worlds, you know, and there was a blip, um, at the end of, what is it? What was the last one? Um, uh, M no. Oh my gosh. What is the last book in the throne of glass series? What's the name? Do you remember? What is it? Kingdom of Ash. Okay. Kingdom of Ash. Okay. So the last book of Kingdom and Ash, Aileen skips worlds as well and waves to Resand. That's a whole thing that happens there. So now it's like now Bryce has teleported into Resand and Feyre's world. And it's like, so now I have all these questions where it's, you know, did the Asteri um infiltrate their world as well were you know the valve what was the valve like part of the series as well like were they a part of the same world because they don't remember where their world is like there's all these thoughts in my head so yeah i did not see that coming no at all. i didn't see it coming i was kind of bummed because i would have heard I would have rather she jumped to the Throne of Glass universe just because I'm more familiar with it. And so the Akatar is lost on me. Um, but As you said, I think she is writing for her fans because there's also like something going around where it's like they should have seen the title referencing something because the House of Sky and Breath is a ref is like a reference to a Kotar. So, okay. Yeah. So now I have no idea what to think in my brain because at oh, I don't want to say because I'm going to spoil everything for you. Anyway, not going to do Girl, it. Girl, I don't care. But because there's just so many left untold stories in. Um, the Court of Thorns and Roses series that are still left, like, dealt with. Like, Asriel is still not mated. We don't know who his mate is. Um, and we just had Cassian and Nesta's story. So now it's like, is he going, is, how does that all work? And why does Rhysian look like Rune? What does that mean? Who? You know, is Bryce's father the Autumn King? Is he, um, you know, the descendant of the Autumn Court? Like, is that a thing? Is Ruin a descendant of the Night Court from his mom's side? Like, all all of these, <laughs> all of these things, I have questions about because Ruin has same dark hair, um, very similar colored eyes. Bryce looks a lot like. Um, Lucien or Lucian. So, yeah, all these things. <laughs> okay. That's all I got. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I think that wraps it up, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> what are your guys' theories? Don and I want to know because poor Don probably won't join the next read with me unless nope. you finish the Kotar series then we can chat I'm not gonna but finish I... that series what's your problem it's too convoluted it's too much I like a very simple plot and character development I don't like all that stuff happening I don't like it it's okay Ashley, Ashley likes it I'll tell it to you for you <laughs> We really appreciate you guys joining us for our discussion of House and Sky and Breath. 
we don't know what our next book is done. Is it all the rage? Are we reading all the rage? You're right. <laughs> We're reading all the rage. Which uh, is that the Saba? It's the Saba one, right? Yeah. Saba to here. Mm-hmm. Okay. All the Rage by Saba Tahir. I thought we were reading Gallant by B.E. Schwab. So I apologize first. Well, I have All the Rage checked out and it's due back in like eight days. So I think we should just do that one first. We're going to do All the Rage by Saba Tahir, which I'm excited to read though because like Saba wrote Ember in the Ashes and Donna and I both loved Ember in the Ashes. The rest of the series is you know, to each his own opinions. I'm curious to see how this is going to go for us. It's realistic fiction. That's my only reservation. <sighs> we can do it. We can do it, Dom. We're branching out. We're branching out. It's going to be great. Yeah. So if you um, ever pop on YouTube, John sometimes posts our videos to YouTube as well. And she's been doing some posts on Instagram for us as well because she's got all the time to read for us (laughs) so we really appreciate you joining us and we will catch you in the next podcast bye-bye bye-bye